Hello you dirty potters! How are you today? In today's video, we're going to talk about how fast your clay dries and drying your work. If you're watching this video, it's a pretty good chance that you're a beginner in the clay space and the clay culture, and you're wondering how fast clay dries, or some of the variables that really dictate how fast your work dries in the first place. And in today's video, we're going to address both of those things. There's two main portions to this video, both of which I'll timestamp for you, but the first one are the stages of drying your clay. There's about five really important ones, and realistically there's like nine, but those are the really technical ones. But you and I really just need to worry about five of them. And in the second portion of this video, we're going to talk about some of the variables that really dictate how fast your clay body dries, so that you can better work with your pottery as you go about your day. The main thing you really ought to know as a knowledge base are the main stages of drying for your clay. A lot of us call these the leather phases. Now there's about five of them, and they're all fairly important. The first phase is wet work. No, not that kind. Wet or fresh work is super new clay right after you're done throwing it directly off of the wheel. It still has a lot of water in it and because of the nature of clay and how porous it is, it is completely saturated with water and it's super wet, super malleable, super tacky, and the high majority of the time, if you're taking it off the wheel or off of a bat from the wheel, you're gonna let it sit out and dry for a little bit until it becomes leather soft. Leather soft is when it becomes a tiny bit less wet, the clay body is still super saturated with a bunch of water in the porous network. The good thing about this phase is that this is the phase when you can handle it a tiny bit more, but you can also make altered work as well. This phase is really important for potters like me who make shapes and then go, I want a different shape after I take it off the wheel. So if I want to make shapes like this or I want to make shapes like this, I can very easily do that in the leather soft phase. If you decide to kind of sculpt in this phase, tools work fantastically on it and you might have to get your hands wet a little bit as the clay body is no longer wet and tacky to the touch. But you still might want your hand or some tools to hydroplane over the clay body. So some people get like a bucket of water and they'll start to kind of sculpt their stuff in this phase, especially when they take it off the wheel and they're making what we call altered work. After it dries a little bit more, it goes into the leather or leather medium phase. The leather or leather medium phase, many of us culturally just kind of say it's leather and we assume that if you didn't say soft or hard, we just assume it's the medium phase. This is about the halfway stage to drying your work. Many of us choose to carve, trim, attach, score and slip, pull handles, things of that nature in this stage. A little potter tip here, if you're planning on attaching anything to your clay body, make sure it's in the leather or less stage and it generally comes out okay as long as you dry it evenly. But don't try and attach like a leather hard or a bone dry piece of work to something that's in the leather phase. Otherwise you're gonna have to do a bunch of magic work and get some special materials and some special vinegar and things of that nature that you really don't want to mess with. It's better to just make sure you attach your handles either in the leather soft going to leather phase or in the leather phase right when you're done trimming. The leather phase being the halfway point to the drying process is essentially where you want to get the majority of your work done if you're not planning to alter your piece. As I said before, this is where your trimming and attaching stages come from usually. After the leather medium phase comes the leather hard phase. In the leather hard phase, you ought to be doing whatever you want to do to your clay body before it gets to the next phase. This is almost completely dried out work. It's going to be very difficult for you to attach sprigs or molds or anything of that nature to the clay body. This is also the stage in which most of us apply a lot of our underglazes and a lot of our slips. As a little side note here, you do have to remember that a lot of glazes and underglazes are really just minerals and rocks floating in water. The water is pretty much the, the thing that carries it onto the clay body, and because the porous network of clay body has nice open dry pores that accepts the water and anything that comes in with it. But if you try and put underglaze or glaze or any type of slips or paints on in the leather soft phase or even the leather phase, sometimes that water kind of smudges whatever you're trying to draw. So a lot of us try and do this work in the leather hard phase where there's not a lot of water in the clay body. and it's at its most easy to handle without being overly dry. The leather hard phase is pretty much where we do a lot of our painting. Finally, there is the bone dry phase. This is where as much water has evaporated out of the clay body and the clay porous network as comfortable for its immediate surroundings. And that sounds weird, right? But we'll explain it a little bit more later. But just know that the bone dry phase is, is exactly what it sounds like in a definition. It is bone dry. The bone dry phase is essentially where we start thinking about putting our clay bodies into the kiln the first time, which is what we call the bisque kiln. The bisque kiln is where we chemically drive off a lot of the water that's in the clay body, but majoritively it's just so that we can handle the work and glaze it, and the porous network opens up to accept a lot more glaze. That, that's pretty much it. 
Now, before someone asks this in the comments below, yes, you can technically skip the bisque phase by just glazing your greenware, which is what all these drying categories fall under. All these categories being wet, leather soft, leather, leather hard and bone dry, all fall underneath the greenware category. This is what we call work before it goes in the bisque. But technically speaking, and I say technically because it takes a lot of knowledge to do, you can skip the bisque phase by just glazing greenware and then firing it to a glaze load. This is not something that most of us suggest as it takes a very special firing schedule and realistically it's pretty difficult to one shot or one glaze things surpassing the bisque phase simply because again there's water in our glazes and there's water in your unhardened clay body and a lot of the times if I dip let's say this right here which is not fired at all it's pretty green into a bucket of water it's just going to get oversaturated with water and it's going to ruin the product. As a major potter tip here, there's a lot of people who can't really tell the difference visually in between something like leather hard leather or bone dry work simply by looking at it and touching it. If you have work that still has a little bit of water in it, which means it's absolutely not ready to go into the bisque, then it'll probably be a little bit more darkened because light has trouble passing through the water until it looks a little bit darker and it's a little bit more wet and watery to the touch. You can feel that it's cold and wet to the touch. A good example of this is that this right here is probably going to leather hard fairly soon. I'm not gonna trim it, I'm probably gonna chuck it because I messed up on it. As this is bone dry, this can go into the kiln right now. Keep in mind the amazing thing about this is that these are both the exact same clay body. They're just different amounts of water in them. One being ready for the bisque at completely dry bone wear, and this one being essentially leather hard, not ready to go into the bisque kiln yet. There's a clear visual difference in the amount of water in these. And if you touch this one, it seems fairly dry and non-cold to the touch. As this one feels very, very cold, watery, and non-dry at all. I can probably still carve with this, even though it probably mess up some of my tools. So keep in mind, there are visual indicators to these things. Now that we're done with the drying stages of your work and what you can do in those stages, let's talk about how your clay dries and some of the variables that really dictate how fast your clay is gonna dry. Firstly, we have to understand that the speed in which your clay dries is mainly dictated on how fast the water evaporates out of your clay body. And there's a couple variables with that, but that's really all it is. It's water evaporating out of the pores network of your clay, as, as shown in this graph here. I actually found one that clearly dictates pottery. This is dependent on the material, but with pottery that is very open and porous, much like sponges and clothes, you can kind of just leave them out in the sunlight or leave them out in a regular old room and they will dry slowly over time. All in all, there's about three main factors or variables that really decide how fast your clay dries. These three variables, going from the greatest to the least, honestly, are number one, humidity. How humid or how much water there is in any given area in the air really dictates how fast your clay is going to dry. This is why a lot of us try and make things like damp boxes. We'll spray the inside of the box, put our work in there, close it up, and make sure that it's in its own little biodome of humid moisture. I myself like to wrap my work up, I spray it, I put it on wood, much like this, and then I just kind of cover it with these plastic bags that create a dome of moisture around it so that the water doesn't evaporate as fast. This is a major reason why in the summer your clay bodies are gonna dry way faster than somewhere like in the winter, or even an area that rains a lot. And I live in California, so we only have flood and fire all the time. In the summer when it's well over 100 degrees and there's very little humidity in the air, I can probably go through a bag of clay just because while I'm working on the current thing, the thing that I just threw is drying from top to bottom very, very quickly. But in the winter, I can throw about 50 pounds of clay and leave it out without even covering it and it probably takes a full day to dry with no cover on it. In the summer, it must be covered. It has to be covered. It is January 5th of 2021, and I threw these last night. I've left them out to air dry, and they are still extremely wet. If you look, you can probably still see the water at the bottom of most of these forms. Even though I threw these about 12 hours ago and let them air dry, because it's winter and it's so cold and wet, and moist outside, you can still very easily still move the clay body around. Of course, this is geographically dependent. If you live in a place, like I lived in Japan for a couple years and it was summer, but it was also very humid and raining because they live very close to the sea. 
th there was really no problem with drying my work in the summer. I kind of let it stay out. And people make all kinds of contraptions to get around this. This being the largest factor of how fast your clay body dries so that you can work on it in those five stages we previously talked about. They, they, make, they make towers with little shields over them. They get boxes they call damp boxes. When I went to college to be trained for ceramic artwork training, they had this room that sprayed out mist, much like a little sprayer, but it did it based on the level. So if the humidity levels in the room went underneath a certain amount, there was a couple sprayers in the room that would then spray liquid out in, into the atmosphere and we would keep it inside of an enclosed room, making sure that our work lasted for weeks, if not months at a time sometimes. I missed that damp room. We had school funding and it was a magical time. The second variable that really decides how fast your clay dries is clay thickness. Thicker pieces understandably hold more water because there's more clay and more pores to hold more water. The thinner the clay body, the easier it is for the water to evaporate out, or rather the amount of water is lessened, so there's less water to evaporate out. This one's pretty obvious, but do keep in mind it becomes extremely obvious with your pulling technique. A lot of beginners will end up not pulling so much from the bottom, and they don't pull a lot of clay from the bottom to the top of their cylinders. I'm willing to bet, in fact, that a lot of you have noticed that your clay body at the top will be discolored while the bottom still has this kind of color to it that I had shown you earlier. While the top of your cylinder looks nice and dry, the bottom still looks kind of wet, like this. Now that I have said it, I bet you will notice that if you leave your clay out for a prolonged period of time, especially in a not so humid or hot environment, you'll most likely notice that the top of your work is drying much faster than the bottom of your work. This is most likely because your work is a little bit uneven, and some parts of your clay body are thicker, naturally, as they will be, as some other parts like the top, which are usually thinner. The third variable, which is the least important one realistically, but I feel like a lot of people put this one on a stake and try and burn it, is the type of clay body you have. Uh, the type of clay body you have really doesn't dictate how fast your clay dries, but I will say that stoneware clay generally holds a little bit more water than something like porcelain or porcelainous clay. In grog or stoneware clay, there's a lot of things added to it to give it a little bit more grit and body, and longevity, and because of that, some of those things hold a little bit more water. But in porcelain, there's not a lot of grog in there to hold that amount of space. So there's less water and less space to go around. Because of this, I have noticed that porcelain clay bodies dry about an hour or two faster in the same environment than stoneware clay bodies. Stoneware clay bodies just have more body, so they have more space to hold water. That's essentially it. Well, porcelain clay bodies don't really have that. But if you're a beginner, you're probably not messing with porcelain by now. But in your experience, you will probably notice that if you leave porcelain out next to stoneware and you threw them the exact same way, the porcelain dries the tiniest bit faster. And I do truly mean the tiniest bit. And those are essentially the five main stages of drying that you need to be worried with and the three main variables that really dictate how fast your clay dries. Now, if you clicked on this video thinking, how, how can I make sure that my clay dries slower because I go to work on the weekends and then I come back, there's a couple of things that you can do. Number one, you should be wrapping your work up with some type of plastic bag. A good quality garbage bag does really well, but make sure that it's malleable and it's not stiff. I see plenty of students try and cover their work by just putting like the bag of the clay came in on top of it and that doesn't really work because it's too stiff. You really wanna cover it up and surround it in its own little globe, making sure that there aren't a lot of air holes or air getting into the product. Faster it's gonna dry, so no air touching your work, and keeping it inside this little biodome of humidity, especially if you spray it a little bit, works pretty well. Number two and three, you can make a damp box or a damp room. Now, a damp room is really difficult to make. It's literally a room that is the third of a garage size full of just wet, uh, damp wear with a little humidifier, and it's, it's crazy. You could also put a humidifier in your garage, but you better be insulating it pretty well because those are fairly large spaces. A damp box is pretty good as well. Uh, there's plenty of ways to do it. I will post a tutorial down below for you. It is not mine. I will give credit where credit is due, but I will post that down in the description below for you. It's pretty good for beginners because a lot of you aren't making tons and tons and tons of work as it is. You're not pumping out 25 cups in an hour. You're probably making like six things in an hour maximum. The fourth thing you can do is make it rain. And unless you're a little Wayne or two chains, it's gonna be quite difficult for you to do that on a regular basis. That's mainly because whenever it rains, there's a lot more humidity in the air because you know, it's dropping from the sky. And as we've discussed before, the more humidity in the air, the slower your pottery dries. That was a really long way to just say, if it's raining, your work's probably gonna dry slower. A couple of potter tips before we go. Before you wrap your work up with that nice malleable bag and make sure there's no air holes and it's nice tucked in like a two-year-old who's afraid of scary monsters, make sure you spray your work with just water, a little bit, give it five or six sprays, 
wrap it up, add some extra humidity and moisture to the environment that you're now going to enclose it in. It'll dry way slower. Tip number two, you can put a humidifier in the room that you're working in, especially if it's a small room. I have a very large garage here, and because of that, a humidifier would literally do nothing. But sometimes I get really desperate and I put all my work on this board and then I cover it and I stick the humidifier hose, because mine has a hose, underneath the thing and I just kind of let it pump for a while. But you can guarantee it stays wet. You can definitely guarantee it. Well, thank you, Dirty Potters, for joining me today. I think if you clicked on this video, you're relatively new and you're either wondering how work dries or you're having a hard time with your work drying a little too fast. You're probably one of those people who works on your stuff puts it to the side and you don't make things very quickly yet. I'm just, I'm just guessing, this is my experience. So what you do is you end up in an 80 degree environment working on one piece or three pieces for like two hours and by the time you go back to that first piece you threw, it's already drying out and you're kind of wondering, well, how do I slow this? You essentially have to wrap up your work or you have to really check the weather updates or make sure there's enough humidity in the room to make sure the water doesn't evaporate out of that. Hopefully this video helped a lot of the newbies out. Remember to click all those YouTube buttons so that other potters like yourself can find this information and have an easier time with their work. Good luck on your next kiln load, and I will see you, dirty potters, next week. Thank you for your patronage. Another big thing, and I was thinking about not saying this because I thought it would sound insulting, but um, a lot of you will get clay out of a bag, and then you will work on your stuff with the clay you grabbed out of the bag, and you'll leave the bag of clay open. And you do have to remember you have now exposed it to air that is technically less humid than whatever was in that bag.